So right now we're in a period that's um, being dubbed as the sixth mass extinction. And so we're seeing biodiversity losses throughout the world. And unfortunately, amphibians have been identified as one of the taxa that are most threatened with declines, more so than birds and more so than mammals. Um, some threats have included disease, things like chytrid or ronavirus, um, but also habitat loss and habitat degradation. And the latter two are primarily anthropogenic causes. Um, they're human causes, human cause. And one of the reasons that amphibians are so uh, sensitive to this habitat loss and habitat degradation is that they've been shown to be sensitive to environmental change. Um, many have called them uh, ecological indicators um, due to the fact that they're so sensitive to environmental change. Um, one of the reasons that they're sensitive to environmental change is this thin, uh, moist layer of skin that many of them have. And they not only breathe through that skin, but they osmoregulate through that skin. And so they're exchanging ions uh, through that skin layer. It's fairly permeable. Because of this, amphibians are fairly sensitive to changes in temperature, they're sensitive to changes in moisture, and they're uh, sensitive uh, to coming in contact with things like contaminants because that skin layer is so permeable. Wetlands are a particularly important habitat for a certain type of amphibians, the pond breeding amphibians. Pond breeding amphibians not only rely on the aquatic environment, but also the terrestrial environment. Uh, they rely on those wetlands or those ponds for their reproduction. They lay their eggs and the larvae uh, grow within that wetland. Um, but then later in their life, they need access to the terrestrial habitat. So they need both wetlands and they need that intact terrestrial habitat. Unfortunately, wetlands worldwide have also seen declines. You know, wetlands have been drained um, for urban uses, agricultural uses, transportation. Um, they've been um, uh, strained for disease mitigation. And so um, worldwide, we've seen some declines in wetlands. So this figure here is showing the percentage of wetland acreage lost between the 1780s and the 1980s. And most of this uh, wetland acreage loss occurred in the 50s and 60s. Um, you can see here in Kentucky, during this time period, we lost about 81% of our wetlands. In West Virginia, where my study uh, took place, there was about 24% of the wetlands lost during that time period. So between 1998 and 2004, there was a net gain of 220,200 uh, freshwater wetland acres. This sounds pretty encouraging, right? We see this net gain of freshwater acres. You know, this doesn't sound like losses. Um, but when we take a further look at the numbers, what we see is that there's been over 700,000 acres of open water ponds that have been created. And so these ponds that were created um, were oftentimes created as mitigation wetlands for those wetlands that were um, lost, those natural wetlands that have been lost as part of a, a no net loss policy. Um, open water ponds uh, can oftentimes be characterized by these deep basins. They're typically fairly deep, not always, but typically. Um, they often have steep uh, bank slopes that inhibit vegetation growth. Uh, they oftentimes have permanent hydro periods versus natural wetlands, which uh, sometimes have more ephemeral or semi-permanent hydro periods. Hydro period is just the amount of time in the year that the wetlands are holding water. And um, oftentimes they're placed in degraded landscapes. So many questions have been raised about whether or not um, the artificial or created wetlands um, are replacing the same functions that were lost when we lost uh, natural wetlands. So it's been um, a question that's been investigated quite a bit, but there hasn't been a lot of um, clear answers to this. So surface mining uh, for coal is something, it's a land use that has, a, um, has impacted uh, many, many, many thousands of acres in Appalachia, particularly in uh, central Appalachia. In this process, uh, the vegetation has been removed the rock and soil is uh, blasted away to access the coal seam below, which is then mined. Mines that were mined post-1977, the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act uh, took place. Um, they're reclaimed according to the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act. So essentially, um, the land has to be reduced or it has to be restored to its original contour. It has to be compacted to reduce large-scale erosion or landslides, essentially. Um, and then it has to be revegetated, and it can be native vegetation or non-native native vegetation. And oftentimes, um, it's been non-native vegetation. But because of this compaction, um, oftentimes these areas end up in a state of arrested development. What this means is that vegetation growth and reproduction is either very slow or it halts altogether. 
So because of this compaction and this arrested development that can occur on these lands, oftentimes they're kind of written off as like this deserted ecological wasteland. They're not providing those ecological habitats, ecological um, habitats and functions that they did pre-mining. But the question remains whether or not we can take these areas and restore some of those functions. And so the idea is that if we can decompact that soil, we can uh, restore native vegetation communities. And if we create native habitat features, such as wetlands for creatures like uh, pond breeding amphibians, can we restore some of that function and potential um, that was there pre-mining? So there have been quite a few studies, uh, particularly that have been done in my own lab, um, that have investigated uh, amphibian utilization of streams that have been affected by surface mining. And so um, generally these studies have found that there are lower stream salamander occupancy and abundances in streams affected by surface mining compared to those in reference or control streams. So they're seeing a lower uh, occupancy of particular species and a lower uh, in number of individuals of those species. And there has been some debate and some different ideas um, of the potential mechanisms. Uh, a couple have been proposed. Um, habitat connectivity is one of them. Uh, sometimes it's uh, thought that uh, it's difficult for these amphibians to move around that degraded landscape um, due to their sensitivity in the change uh, in the environment that we talked about. Um, but also water quality has been something that's been fairly um, strongly discussed, particularly conductivity. Generally, um, lower salamander occupancy and abundance has been associated with elevated stream conductivity associated with mining. What about wetlands? Well, not as much has been looked into uh, involving surface uh, mining and wetlands. Uh, Laufman 2005 found that uh, eastern red spotted newts were able to breed in artificial wetlands on abandoned uh, surface mine in West Virginia while spotted salamanders were able to lay eggs, but no growth or development of those eggs occurred. So generally, um, they found that maybe this is providing a suitable habitat for the newts, but not so much for the spotted salamander. Lanou et al. 2009 suggested that mine soil habitats, including various wetlands found on them, uh, could be critical habitats for threatened and endangered species. And the reason he thought this is because he found the northern prophet frog, which in Indiana is a threatened major species, as well as a few other threatened species, to inhabit the mine spoil uh, habitats and the uh, northern prophet frog is a pond breeding amphibian. In Stiles 2016, found that the colonization of 14 amphibian species to a reclaimed strip mine uh, suggested that um, reclaimed, restored, or properly managed post-disturbance landscapes may provide adequate amphibian breeding habitat. So um, this is providing some hope that maybe these uh, reclaimed mine lands could be useful, but there have been no studies to date looking at uh, areas that have been uh, decompacted or in the process of reforestation and whether or not we can supply that pond breeding habitat that existed pre-mining. Uh, pre -mining. So that's really our main question here is can reforested surface mines provide habitat uh, for pond breeding amphibians? In order to answer this question, uh, we devised three main objectives. Um, the first objective was to investigate whether habitat parameters differed among wetlands and created in different years. And so in this study, we had um, 40 different wetlands, 10 of which that were created in four different years. So we had wetlands that were two years old at the time, four years old, six years old, and eight years old, or created in 2010, 12, 14, and 16. And so we needed to investigate how the habitat parameters varied among those age classes to help inform um, what the differences are in this, in this site and among those wetlands. The second objective was to investigate amphibian occupancy and abundance in the wetlands. Um, we wanted to know which species were occurring where and in what abundances and what parameters were informing the occupancy and abundance. And finally, the third objective is to determine which habitat parameters are most important for amphibian utilization of the wetlands. And so what we did is we took the first two, the results of the first two objectives and used those to inform the third objective. So this brings me to the study site. Um, the area that I was on was called the Mauer Tract. 
It's a 40,000 acre tract of land located on Cheat Mountain in the Monongahela National Forest. Um, the little dot on the map kind of indicates where that is. Um, it, it, the peak elevation in this area is about 4,000 feet. Historically, it would have been a red spruce, northern hardwood, birch forest with a thick accumulation of peat, poor soils, and scattered open water throughout. Unfortunately, in the 1920s, um, the area was heavily logged and uh, was subsequently burned of a naturally hot wildfires. And in these unnaturally hot wildfires, not only was the peat um, burned and destroyed, which sometimes would burn up for to up to 20 years, um, but the seed stock that was within that peat was destroyed. Later in the 1980s, about 2,000 acres of the Mauer tract was surface mined for coal. The area was reclaimed according to the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act. It was restored to its original contour. It was compacted. And in this case, it was planted with non-native grasses and conifers. And those conifers uh, included the Norway spruce as opposed to the red spruce and uh, some other pine species. Unfortunately, in this area, um, due to the compacted soils um, and the pervasiveness of this non-native vegetation, no native vegetation was able to colonize and um, growth ended up in this arrested development. So essentially the vegetation grew, um, but there was no reproduction happening. So this forest has ended up in a successional state where it was no longer moving forward. So the Forest Service then buys this land um, and it becomes part of the U.S. Forest Service Monongahela National Forest Green Fire District. Then comes on the scene in 2009 is the Central Appalachian Red Spruce Reforestation Initiative. And in 2010, the Forest Service partners with the US, for, US uh, Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement's Appalachian Regional Reforestation Initiative and Green Forest Work, which is a reforestation oriented nonprofit. And so in 2010, they begin this reforestation effort, uh, starting in um, the oldest wetlands, the eight year old wetlands. The first step was to decompact the soil. Um, the area was deep ripped. So what this involves is there's a bulldozer. It's knocking down the vegetation that's there. Um, the, veg the trees that are knocked down are left on site for woody debris loading, um, building up some of that carbon in the soil. Um, but this big blade is dragged behind that bulldozer and essentially acts as a giant garden hose, decompacting that soil. And so it's ripped in a crisscross pattern. Following ripping, uh, wetlands were created. In 2010, um, the eight-year-old wetlands, the wetland creation methodology was a little bit different than the other years. Um, they were designed by a wetlands biologist. They were placed just outside of the ripped area. They're placed either within the forest or on the forest edge. And um, so as a result, they tended to uh, retain some of that conifer canopy cover, some of the vegetation that had been there and they were relatively close to the forest. Later on in 2014 and 2016 and 2012, um, the younger wetlands, um, that creation was done a little bit more opportunistically, uh, where there were clay, clay soils identified or, wetland, or water was already being held is where uh, wetlands were placed. And so um, during wetland uh, creation, habitat features were placed within the wetlands. If you look at the top photo um, of that wetland, you'll see that there are, there's a down tree in there, there's logs, um, there's some rocks in there. And so those are placed as microhabitat features within the wetlands. Things that have been identified in other studies that can impact recipient utilization of wetlands. So instead of just this open uh, body of water, they've created, placed these habitat features within the wetlands. And finally, in the spring, uh, following uh, wetland creation and deep ripping, the area is revegetated with native red spruce and northern hardwoods, as well as the wetland banks are reseeded with native vegetation. So, for my experimental design, uh, I have used 40 wetlands, 10 of which were in each age class. As a reminder, those age classes were two years old, four years old, six years old, or eight years old, were created in 2016, 14, 12, and 10. We determined surface area prior uh, to sampling, and we set soil and spar loggers and levels of loggers out in the deepest spot uh, in the wetlands prior to sampling in May. So bar loggers measure barometric pressure. Those are placed in two different spots on the study site, opposite ends. 
Level loggers are placed within the wetlands in the deepest spot. They're placed in six of the 10 wetlands and they measured pond uh, water depth or water height. And so these tubes that you see poking up out of the wetlands, um, those are holding the uh, level logger. And at the bottom, there's a mesh screen so water is able to flow through where they don't get bogged down with sediment. Habitat sampling. Um, prior to amphibian sampling, we always collected a 50 milliliter water sample. Um, we, that was later analyzed in the forest hydrology lab for pH, alkalinity, conductivity, turbidity, metals, phosphate, sulfate, nitrate, and ammonia. We counted the number of rocks and the number of logs. The number of rocks um, with a 15 centimeters or greater diameter and the number of logs with a four centimeter greater diameter. Um, the reason um, that we use, use them at these sizes and we counted them is that um, they've been shown to be important for uh, microhabitat uh, within the wetlands. As I mentioned earlier, we had, they had placed microhabitat features within the wetlands during creation. We also measured depth uh, before every sample. Um, depth was measured at the deepest spot within each wetland. Um, we did this for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, not every wetland had a level logger within it. And so um, if we were gonna look at hydro period, um, we need an idea of how deep the wetlands were, how much water was in the wetlands, um, even those that did not have level loggers. Uh, percent canopy cover and percent vegetation cover were both measured in the month of July when vegetation was at its peak. Percent canopy cover was measured using a spherical crown densiometer by standing in the middle of the wetland. Percent vege vegetation cover was measured using square meter quadrats. And so how this was done is the percent vegetation, um, both emergent and submergent, submergent was uh, estimated in each square meter quadrat, one place on the north bank, one place on the south bank, and two places in the center of the wetland. And those four quadrats were averaged to get the total percent vegetation cover. We also uh, calculated distance to nearest forest, stream, and wetland. We used National Land Cover Database uh, data in order to determine uh, the forest edge. We had a stream layer supplied by the US Forest Service. And we had um, the GPS coordinates for all wetlands uh, surrounding the study wetland. And so we used the NEAR tool with an arc map of ArcGIS to do that. Hydro period uh, was calculated um, using the Solanus Level Logger 4.03 software. And so the software compensated the level logger readings with the um, barometric pressure readings from the bar logger. We also had a calculated change in depth um, for hydro period uh, as well. For actual amphibian sampling, uh, we took five samples uh, May through July, 2018. We used 16 by nine D-frame dip nets. These are fairly typical uh, nets used in wetland sampling. Uh, the number of sweeps uh, was determined based on the wetland size. That's why it was important for us to determine surface area prior to sampling. We did two sweeps per square meter. Uh, this ensured that um, sampling uh, was equivalent for all wetlands. The minimum number of sweeps that we took was five and the maximum was 52. All cover types were sampled evenly. So this included emergent vegetation, submergent vegetation, open water, logs, rocks, et cetera. And adult and larval amphibians were counted and identified down to species. For our statistical analyses, we used a one-way ANOVA and IBM SPSS for both physical and water quality data. And we also used a hierarchical occupancy abundancy model approach with AIC model selection. And we did this using the unmarked, pa unmarked package within our studio. And so models included um, day of year, day of year squared, as well as a null for possible detection covariates in age, conductivity, conductivity squared, vegetation cover, and canopy cover as possible occupancy covariates. And so day and day of year, day of year and day of year squared um, were used as detection covariates because different amphibians are breeding at different times within the season. And so we're going to expect to see um, different peaks of those occupancy and abundance at different times within the sampling period. Age um, is known to affect what, um, amphibian utilization of wetlands in terms of how long it takes them to be colonized. Conductivity, um, we know is important in streams that are affected by surface mining. And so it's important to look at conductivity um, in this case, because we are on a surface mine. 
And vegetation cover and canopy color are both known to affect amphibian utilization of wetlands and other studies. We had enough data to look at occupancy for five species and abundance for four species. And the reason we only looked at four species for abundance is because the abundance models are a little bit more data hungry than the occupancy model. Okay, so the first thing uh, we looked at was hydro period. And what we found is that none of the wetlands with loggers dried. Um, and only two wetlands dried within the two-year-old age class. There was one wetland within the eight-year-old age class, the oldest wetlands, um, that remained dry for the entire study period. It was wet when we identified it as a potential wetland, but then was dry for the entire sampling period. And so you can see in this figure, we have month on the x-axis and precipitation on the y-axis. Uh, loggers were set out from May prior to sampling and were left out through October, and they were checked periodically. And so um, if you look at the blue line, the 2018 precipitation, you'll see that it's quite a bit higher than the 20 year mean precipitation. Um, and I can say that when we were at the wetlands, um, it rained, and by rain, I mean poured on us almost every single day. It was an incredibly wet summer. It's already um, an area that receives a lot of precipitation. And so um, this would be likely why we didn't see the drying that we had expected to see. And so we expected to see more drying because based on some uh, evidence that was um, anecdotal evidence from the U.S. Forest Service, um, some of the wetlands uh, had been known to periodically dry. Okay, so this table contains the results from the one-way ANOVA for physical habitat parameters. We have the parameter in the far left column, in age in the top row. And I'm just going to talk about a few of these, um, but significance is uh, shown with the asterisks and where that significance is, is shown um, with the letters within each box. So while in surface area varied significantly among age classes, it was significantly larger in the oldest wetlands than in the younger wetlands. Canopy cover was significantly greater in the older wetlands versus the younger wetlands. Vegetation cover was significantly greater in the four-year-old wetlands and the eight-year-old wetlands versus the two-year-old and the six-year-old wetlands. And distance to the nearest forest was significantly smaller in the oldest wetlands, or shorter in the oldest wetlands than in the younger wetlands. So this table contains the results from the one-way NOVA for water quality. Again, we have the parameter in the far left column, and we have the age in the top row. Significance is indicated with an asterisk, and where that significance is, is, is indicated by the numbers within each box, the letters within each box. And so I'm not going to talk about all these, but I'll point out the ones that I think are most important to mention. The first, of course, is conductivity. Conductivity did vary significantly among wetland age classes, but there was not a clear pattern. pH uh, was significantly lower in the oldest wetlands versus the youngest wetlands. Alkalinity was significantly lower in the oldest wetlands versus the younger wetlands. And in fact, the alkalinity was zero for all wetlands within this age class. Sulfate was significantly greater in the oldest wetlands versus the younger wetlands. And nitrate and ammonia was significantly smaller or significantly greater in the youngest wetlands, the two-year-old wetlands, versus the other age classes. Just as a reminder, uh, the first objective was to investigate whether habitat parameters uh, differed among wetland ages. Um, and so we found that wetlands did not dry uh, due to the abnormally wet season. And it was just one of those years where there was the wetlands saw a lot of precipitation. And these wetlands are primarily precipitation fed. Wetland size, canopy cover, and vegetation cover were higher in distance to the nearest forest, were lowest in the oldest wetlands. And this is likely due to the creation differences in creation methodology. Again, remember these oldest wetlands were placed outside of the ripped area, either in the forest or at the forest edge. So they have um, greater canopy cover, they have some retained vegetation cover, and that distance near the forest as a result is going to be much lower. Conductivity varied significantly among wetland age classes, but there was not a clear pattern. Alkalinity and pH were lowest and sulfate highest in the oldest wetlands. And so this area has been known to receive some acid precipitation um, in the past, acid rain, as well as um, sulfate deposition uh, due to that. And so um, 
Due to the fact that these wetlands, the oldest wetlands, were placed in an area when no ripping occurred, that sulfate and acidic accumulation in the top layers are still um, available, still readily available to leach the wetlands. Um, also, the youngest wetlands that are placed within a ripped area, you know, that, air, that rock has been, that unweathered rock has now been exposed due to ripping, and so there's some buffering capacity um, from that that may dissipate over time. And nitrate and ammonia were highest in the youngest wetlands. This isn't unexpected. Um, these wetlands uh, haven't had the time to develop their microbial communities yet to uh, nitrify and denitrify the excess nitrate and ammonia in the wetlands. So for amphibian result, result um, we captured over 2,200 amphibians total. There were 651 amphibians caught in the two-year-old age class, 598 in the four-year-old age class, 519 in the six-year-old age class, and 475 in the eight-year-old age class. So this bottom table has the species in the far left column in age in the top row. And whether or not there is an X indicates whether or not that species was found during the, in that age class. Green frogs, wood frogs, spring peepers were found in all age classes. The gray tree frog was found only in the oldest age class. The American toad was found in the youngest age class in the oldest age class. Eastern red spotted newt and the spotted salamander was found in uh, all age classes. And the four toed salamander was found only in the oldest wetlands. And uh, a couple things to mention here um, the great tree frog um, was just starting to get to the point where it was sampleable. The amphibians were large enough to be scooped up in the net um, at the end of the study period. So um, we didn't really get a clear picture of uh, their reproduction. Um, just due to the fact that we were just catching the beginning of their emergence, or their, not their emergence, but their uh, sample size. And four-toed salamanders were not something that I had expected to find just based um, on the fact that my sampling protocol was not adequate enough um, to sample for them. Uh, four-toed salamanders, uh, salamander larvae are incredibly tiny, and uh, the holes in my uh, wetland um, dip nets were just uh, too large. And the only reason that we did catch the ones um, that we caught was I happened to have my hand underneath uh, some of the holes in the net as I scooped and we caught two individuals and those were the only two in individuals that we caught within the oldest age class. So um, they're likely not well represented here, uh, more due to sampling technique than anything. So here are occupancy results from the Immaculatum or the spotted salamander. Uh, Best supported occupancy models um, for this species included conductivity, age, and percent vegetation cover. Figure one, you'll see we have mean conductivity in microsiemens per centimeter on the x-axis and occupancy and predicted 95% confidence interval on the y-axis. Age is indicated by a colored line and the confidence, confidence interval around that is um, associated with the color band, same color band um, around that line. And so what we found is that as uh, conductivity increased, we saw an increase in spotted salamander occupancy. And that peak uh, occupancy was reached at a conductivity of approximately 74 microsiemens per centimeter. In figure two, uh, we see that there's a percent vegetation cover uh, on the x-axis and occupancy on the y-axis. Again, age is indicated by a color line and the 95% uh, color band uh, interval around it. And we saw that as percent vegetation increased, uh, occupancy of the spotted salamander tended to decrease. And so um, we see a peak occupancy at 2% vegetation cover. One thing I do want to mention um, before we move on to any of the others is that you do see some fairly wide confidence intervals around these um, estimates, around these age lines. And that's because detection um, did vary a lot. There are some times uh, where we would have no captures or we would capture just a few individuals, and other times we would capture you know, like 100 individuals. And so there's a lot of variation in that detection. The Nothalamus viridescens, or the Eastern Red Spotted Newt occupancy, um, best models included conductivity and age. Con uh, generally, as conductivity increased, uh, occupancy also uh, increased, and we saw a peak occupancy at a conductivity of 74 microsiemens per centimeter. So 
Lithobates, calamitans, or the green frog occupancy models included percent vegetation cover and age. Uh, again, we see um, percent vegetation cover on the x-axis, occupancy in the 95% confidence interval on the y-axis, and uh, age is indicated by a color line and uh, the confidence interval is associated color band around it. And what we see is that uh, once again, as percent vegetation increases, we see an in a decrease in uh, Lithobates clamatans uh, occupancy. One thing I do want to point out um, is that we reach a peak at one at two percent vegetation cover and you'll see if we look at the four-year-old age class it looks like there's a line missing but it's actually up at the top and it's at one and so that means that in every sample in every wetland within the age class we caught green frog. And before I move on um, one thing I do want to mention is that um, wood frogs or Lithobates sylvaticus occupancy. Um, the best supported model was the null model, and so none of the parameters better explained uh, wood frog occupancy than the null. So we don't have anything to represent them here. Like this Christopher, the spring peeper occupancy model included uh, conductivity and conductivity squared. Uh, you'll see we have mean conductivity on the x axis in microstamens per centimeter, occupancy and the probability 95% confidence interval on the y-axis. And uh, what we see is that intermediate conductivity, uh, we see higher amphibian occupancy or higher uh, spring peeper occupancy. And so we see a peak at approximately 43 uh, microstamens per centimeter. Okay, so those were our occupancy results. Now we're moving into abundance. So in Bistum Immaculatum or Spotted Salamander abundance models uh, included conductivity, conductivity squared, and age as abundance covariates. We see in this figure we have conductivity on the x-axis, the microstamens per centimeter, and abundance with the mean and standard error on the y-axis. We generally see a higher uh, in Bistum Immaculatum or Spotted Salamander abundance at intermediate conductivities. Uh, this peak is at 46 microstamens per centimeter. What we also see is that we have the highest abundance in the oldest wetlands, this oldest age class. Notothalamus viridescens of the eastern red spotted newt abundance, uh, best supported models included uh, percent canopy cover and age. So we have percent canopy cover on the x axis and abundance mean standard error on the y axis. We generally see, uh, similar to occupancy, that with increasing canopy cover, we see decreasing abundance of the eastern red spot and newt, and we see a peak at 0% canopy cover. I also want to point out that similar to the spotted salamander abundance, we see higher uh, abundance in the oldest age class uh, versus the other age classes. So the best supported model for Lithobates clematans of the green frog um, was the null. And so none of the parameters that we looked at better explained uh, green frog abundance uh, than the null model. So we don't have representation of them here. This species, uh, Lithobates sabaticus, the wood frog, um, this species was the one that had the, the null model as the best model um, for occupancy. And for abundance, um, the best model included conductivity. Uh, you'll see we have conductivity again on the x-axis, microstamens per centimeter, abundance on the y-axis, and mean standard error. And we see very slight relationship between conductivity and abundance. Increasing conductivity, increasing abundance. But it's very slight, and we do see a, a large conf uh, confidence interval. The peak was reached at approximately 74 microsiemens per centimeter. OK, so just as a reminder, um, the second objective was to investigate amphibian occupancy and abundance in the wetlands. We generally found that amphibian occupancy and abundance tend to increase with increasing or intermediate conductivity and decreasing percent vegetation and canopy cover. I'm going to kind of just leave it at that for now because I'm going to talk about those in more detail in the third objective. Um, but I'm also going to say that salamander abundance was greatest in the oldest wetlands. And some reasons this could be um, the oldest wetlands have had longer period of time to allow for amphibian colonization. Um, spotted salamanders in particular are known to be um, associated with forest connectivity and distance to forest. Um, so um, their proximity to the forest could be a factor, as well as they've had longer for amphibians to find those wetlands, colonize those wetlands, and to immigrate and emigrate from those wetlands. 
uh, wetland size may also be a factor in this. Uh, the oldest wetlands tended to be larger than the youngest wetlands. Uh, one study which was done on the Mauer tract in um, these, this wetland system uh, found that spotted salamander uh, corticosterone levels, or essentially stress levels, um, were higher in uh, wetlands with smaller diameter versus wetlands with a greater diameter. So spotted salamanders were exhibiting uh, more stress in smaller wetlands versus larger wetlands, and our older wetlands were our larger wetlands. But I kind of want to tease this apart a little bit because it seems that the models are kind of contradicting themselves. On one hand, uh, we found that amphibian occupancy abundance was higher in lower percent vegetation and canopy cover. We also found that salamander abundance was highest in the oldest wetlands, wetlands which also had the highest percent vegetation cover and canopy cover. And I think part of this can be pieced apart um, because uh, if I look at, or I think about the wetlands where these amphibians were caught, these high abundances, um, it typically, typically came from three or four wetlands that were placed just outside of the forest. Um, they had lower canopy cover and some, of the, uh, some less vegetation retained around them. And they look more typically uh, like this wetland that you see in the left picture here. That's one of the wetlands where we caught relatively high abundances of salamanders. It's placed just outside of the forest um, versus this wetland on the right, um, which is one of the forested wetlands. Um, there's a lot of canopy cover um, and uh, there's a lot of vegetation that grows uh, within the wetland. And so um, we never caught any salamanders in that wetland. And so it may be just um, that the sample has been skewed uh, towards the older age class, um, towards these parameters um, within that age class that better support um, or better fit the earlier the occupancy abundance model uh, predictions with the lower percent vegetation and canopy cover. Okay, as promised, I'm going to talk about some of the uh, parameters in a little bit more detail with objective three. Uh, which was determine which parameters are most important for amphibian utilization of the wetlands. And so I really can only talk about the parameters um, that, I asked, that I looked at in my models. Um, based on my models, um, we found conductivity, present vegetation cover, and present canopy cover to be influential of amphibian use of wetlands. However, looking at conductivity, um, the conductivity values that we saw in my wetlands um, were six times lower than the highest that was reported by Price et al. 2016 in streams affected by surface mining, and at least two times lower than the lowest uh, conductivity reported by Hutton et al. in 2019 in the, their uh, stream affected by surface mining. So overall, uh, our averages are in the 20s, 30s, and 40s for micro siemens per centimeter, which are much, much lower um, than the values that were reported by uh, streams um, that are affected that had reduced salamander occupancy abundance that are affected by mining. All but one value, of our, all but one of our conductivity values was below the EPA's benchmark for Appalachian aquatic life, which is 300 micro siemens per centimeter. We had one value that exceeded this on one occasion and which promptly, um, by the next sample, went back to um, a more normal conductivity. We generally found that our uh, conductivity values or averages were comparable to those found in Wisconsin vernal pools. And it's not often that conductivity is looked at in wetlands um, and where it has been looked at, our parameters are fairly similar to uh, other wooded wetlands, other uh, vernal pools um, that uh, have looked at conductivity. So although our models did show um, increasing uh, occupancy abundance with increasing our intermediate conductivity, it's not likely that this is biologically significant or biologically limiting based on the fact that our values were so much lower than the values that um, demonstrated reduced occupancy abundance in streams associated with mining. They were below the benchmark for aquatic life and they were comparable to other wetlands. For percent vegetation cover, um, we generally um, tend to see a positive relationship between amphibian utilization of wetlands and percent vegetation cover. And we actually found the opposite. And so um, this may be due um, to the fact that um, there's potentially sampling inadequacy. Um, many wetland studies choose to set traps as well as sample with dip nets, um, possibly for this reason. When you have thick vegetation, it's difficult to get a net in there and to do a good job sampling. It is stuck on the vegetation. And so that could be um, potentially 
and why we are seeing this uh, negative relationship between occupancy abundance and vegetation. And finally, percent vegetation cover. Um, previous studies have suggested that um, there's faster growth and higher diversity in open canopy versus closed canopy wetlands. Generally, uh, we agree with studies. We have found that our results agree with studies that amphibians have greater utilization of wetlands with more open canopy. Um, it can differ based on species and how much of a specialist or non-specialist um, they are in terms of open or closed canopy. Um, but generally, most studies find higher diversity, higher utilization, uh, more growth in more open canopies versus closed canopy wetlands, and uh, we're right in line with those results. All in all, what we found is that amphibians are utilizing these wetlands. Um, we generally found that with lower canopy cover, lower vegetation cover, and higher intermediate conductivity, were associated with increased amphibian occupancy abundance. Um, we found low conductivity values compared to those seen in, seen in streams that have been impacted by surface mining. Again, our values were much, much lower than the streams um, that had found reduced amphibian occupancy abundance. And we generally found uh, that you know, these young wetlands were colonized relatively quickly. Our youngest age class had the highest number of individual captures, and it had the second highest number of species. And so, although previous studies have cited that uh, you know, it may be difficult for amphibians to move around um, these disturbed landscapes, um, here it seems like that's not a problem. Amphibians have been able to make their way even to these young wetlands relatively quickly and utilize them relatively quickly. Um, and this could be due to the fact that there was this, you know, woody debris left um, throughout the rip site. All of those, all of that vegetation that had been there beforehand was left there, um, left on the site. And so perhaps that provided um, some barriers to drying and moisture and uh, carbon uh, influx that uh, is beneficial to amphibian movement around the landscape. Um, generally though, um, we do need to keep looking at whether or not these are gonna be suitable habitat over time. We need to know whether or not these wetlands uh, function as source or sink populations. So to do this, we need to look at recruitment. You know, are amphibians coming here, breeding, and then those uh, larvae are either, you know, dying and not metamorphing, or are, is there actual recruitment to the population, essentially? Um, and we also need to know, how do these wetlands change over time? You know, are they suitable habitat right now? And uh, as they continue succession, maybe they won't be suitable habitat in future. Or potentially, maybe they're not that suitable right now, but down the road, they'll be very suitable habitat for wetlands. And although I, I think we have decent recruitment in these wetlands, anecdotally, uh, we did see a lot of larval amphibians and we saw a lot of metamorph leading wet, wet, wetlands. So that's very encouraging. Um, so generally, um, this is really encouraging. You know, these are areas that had been stuck in arrested development. Um, there are many areas throughout Appalachia that are stuck in a similar state. You know, they don't have the pre-mining amphibian or wildlife communities that they had at the pre-mining habitats. And this is a, a great opportunity to potentially create and restore uh, wetland habitat um, in areas that you know, have been sitting devoid for quite a while. And with that, I would like to thank uh, all of the people who helped me with this work. Um, there's a quote by Andy Knoll, who's a geologist with Harvard University. And it's that science is a richly social endeavor. And it really is. There's nothing that you can really do alone if you're gonna have a really successful study, especially a field study. And there's a lot of partnerships and cooperation. And so in particular, I would like to thank my advisors, uh, Drs. Chris Barton and Stephen Price, who offered me a lot of mentorship and guidance through this whole process, as well as John Cox, who's been a valuable member of my committee and has offered valuable input to my thesis. Andrea Dreyer, who has been there to answer all of my questions and uh, hear all of my ideas. Um, her familiarity with wetland studies has proved to be really um, crucial for me and being able to talk to her about different ideas that I have. Uh, Wendy Lumenberger was uh, crucial in helping me with my statistics. Thomas Skinner, um, who's pictured here in two of these uh, pictures. Uh, he was the field tech who helped me uh, throughout the summer. He often, uh, begrudgingly so, would wake up at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning to go sample wetlands um, for multiple days in a row. And so I really thank him for all of his help 
uh, in those early mornings. Kylie Schmidt, um, who works for Green Forest Works, she also helped me with some of my field work. You can see her bundled up in the far right picture, um, pretending like she doesn't hate me for making her go out when it was super, super cold. Um, Allison Davis, who helped me with my GIS work. Todd Kunz and Anna Branduzzi, who work for the US Forest Service. Um, they helped me not only with wetland selection and part of my field work, um, but they also helped me just to feel welcome in the area and to kind of get to know West Virginia and some of the opportunities around us. And of course, uh, Millie Hamilton, who works in the Forest Hydrology Lab, without whom uh, none of the water quality data would have been analyzed and we wouldn't have any of that to use. So uh, she's really crucial there. The funding for this project um, was provided by the University of Kentucky Graduate School, the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, uh, the Kentucky Appalachian Center, Chicago Herpetological Society, and the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture, Food, and Environment. And with that, I want to leave you with a uh, Wendell Berry quote. To cherish what remains of the earth and to foster its renewal is our only legitimate hope for survival. And I think this kind of speaks to the fact that, you know, maybe these landscapes have been degraded and they're not what they once were. There's an opportunity to maybe to restore some of those uh, things, those functions, that habitat that's been lost. And so maybe if we can restore uh, some of the habitat that was there pre-mining and some of that function, um, we can do our part to kind of make the world a better place and restore it. So I think that's um, really the kind of the point here. And our study has been uh, really influential in terms of uh, fostering some development in that direction. And with that, I will take any questions that anyone has.